I have reviewed all manner of odd motherboards from AliExpress over the years, but this latest release from 10729 featuring Intel Mobile Raptor Lake CPUs have me unreasonably excited. Are you struggling to play the latest games because your PC just isn't up to the task? Is your new handheld not quite as powerful as you were hoping for? With Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming, you can get access to a powerful gaming PC in the cloud with the ability to stream a wide range of games and programs to nearly any device. Powered by a foundation of open source software like Linux Mint, Proxmox, Sunshine, and Moonlight, you'll have access to a Linux desktop, all pre-configured with Steam, Heroic Games, Lutris, and more. Virtualized gaming machines start at just $9.95 a month Canadian, or around $7.40 US, and you'll be up in gaming just a few minutes after creating your account. Or for uncompromised performance, opt for bare metal access with an AMD 7800X3D CPU and a Radeon RX 7900XT graphics card. I've demoed self-hosted cloud gaming on this channel before, but not everyone's crazy enough to have a server rack out in their garage. Get the flexibility of a cloud gaming system without the hassle of building and maintaining it yourself. Visit MaximumSettings.com or click the link down in the video description to get started today. And thanks to Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Some of the projects on this channel I build literally just for you guys, things that I think you might be interested in. Other times, I have to do things that are just for me, and this PC right here is one I built just for me. This last week, in fact, I attended PDX LAN, and over the years I've built a number of different types of machines for the LAN, from full desktop towers to custom machines like Heavy Metal, which was made out of 3 8 inch steel plate. This time around, though, I wanted to go as lightweight as possible, using a system built inside the Fractal Design Terra. And I have to say, I think I was pretty successful. In fact, both my sister and I went to PDX LAN this last weekend, both of us rocking Fractal Design Terra PCs, and this was the lightest I've ever been able to pack for a LAN party. Both of our PCs, keyboards, mice, and two 27-inch monitors all fit into a single Costco black tub. It was absolutely incredible how much power we actually got crammed into such a small space. Now, while my sister was rocking an Intel 13600K on an ITX motherboard, along with an RTX 4060, my build was, shall we say, a little bit more exotic, rocking a motherboard from 10729 with an engineering sample Intel Mobile 13900H CPU. This is a 14-core, 20-threaded chip with eight performance cores and six efficiency cores. Intel Raptor Lake Mobile is an incredibly fast architecture, with P cores often able to boost all the way up to 5.4 GHz. Most of the time its turbo speeds are limited to about 105 watts, but you can only achieve that in burst rates. It can hold the 105 watt TDP for about 30 seconds before throttling down the power delivery to about 45 watts, severely limiting your overall performance potential. A little over a year ago, I took a look at Earying's motherboards with their Tiger Lake Mobile CPUs on board. It was much the same story, where we would see upwards of 90 watts in turbo mode, but then after 20 to 30 seconds, they would downclock themselves to 45 watts for their sustained performance. I also did a video on that board where I was able to unlock the turbo timer, letting it hold as high of a TDP as it wanted for as long as it wanted, so long as you had enough cooling. When I said in the intro that these 10729 motherboards had me unreasonably excited, I really did mean it, because the ones I've tried here have been unlocked from the factory. That's right, no need for weird BIOS, modifications, or sketchy downloads. These will run at 105 watts unlocked from the word go. Now obviously, this kind of unlock is not sanctioned or supported by Intel at all, and I'd actually be willing to bet this is only available on the engineering sample chips. Again, this particular motherboard is running an Intel 13900H engineering sample, which does still have 14 cores and 20 threads, but it does have a slightly lower base clock than the retail chip would. The other specs on this board are equally as exciting as the CPU performance, though. Down at the bottom here, we've got a PCI Express Gen 4x8 slot for graphics cards. We have a total of three NVMe slots, two of which are Gen 4x4, and the third of which is a Gen 3x4. I will say the rear I.O. for this board is a bit lacking, especially when it comes to USB. We've got four USB 2.0 ports and only a pair of USB 3.0 ports. There's also no native USB-C on the rear of this motherboard. There are some internal headers for additional USB connections though, including a 10 gigabit USB-C header as well as a USB 3 and USB 2.0 headers. 
The board also features dual Ethernet, both of which are powered by Realtek chips. One of which is a 1 gigabit port, the other is actually a 2.5, which is a welcome addition on this platform. Now, there are going to be some people who, wrongfully, down in the comments, complain about the lack of DDR5 on this motherboard. In fact, this board does only support dual-channel DDR4. However, I like the fact that on a budget platform, we're forced to use less expensive memory. See, I don't see DDR5 being that much of a performance uplift in a Raptor Lake mobile CPU, especially when it comes to gaming. I'd much rather save literally half of my money and go with DDR4 on a platform like this. In my particular build, I did load it up with 32GB of DDR4-3600, and it had no problems working at that speed right out of the box. As far as the rest of the build goes, I did load it up with two NVMe drives to test out both of the Gen 4 M.2 slots. One of those was a 1TB Patriot Viper VP4300, the other was a 2TB Western Digital SN770. As the system was built entirely to play games, I wanted as much graphics performance as I could possibly squeeze inside of here, and I managed to squeeze in quite a lot. On the right side of the chassis is an ASUS Tough Series RTX 4070 Ti Super. More on that in just a little bit. For the power supply, we've got a Cooler Master 850 Watt SFX unit, which is fully PCI Express 5.0 compatible. In such tight quarters, this is incredibly important, as I wanted native 12 volt high power 16 pin plugs instead of using a series of adapters, leading to potential fire hazards. Last but not least, I've got a Be Quiet BK034 low profile CPU cooler. Now this cooler has a claimed 100 watts of heat dissipation, and it should have made a perfect match for the 105 watt TDP of the CPU. However, we did see some thermal throttling, and I think that's where we'll start our review. Like I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, Raptor Lake Mobile is an incredibly fast architecture. However, it's also incredibly power hungry and generates a lot of heat. Loading this up with significant CPU load does see that heat start to build up in the CPU, and I did see some throttling in my testing. Starting off with heavy load, we do see thermal throttling happening after just 28 seconds of load. Now, before it throttles, we do see a full 5.4 GHz on two of the P cores and 5.1 GHz out of the rest of them. Meanwhile, the six efficiency cores do max out at around 4 GHz and are able to hold that for the entire 28 seconds. During this initial turbo boost, we see around 105 watts of total power draw from the CPU package. After just 28 seconds of load though, we do see the CPU start to thermal throttle, where it will downclock itself to avoid the CPU getting too hot. In this case, we do see a couple of the cores hit 104 degrees Celsius. Now it should also be noted that 104 degrees Celsius is the rated operating temperature of Raptor Lake mobile CPUs, and it does regularly hit that temperature when it's installed in laptops. At that temperature, the CPU is really not in any danger of melting down. We just don't want to see it get any hotter than 104 degrees. So the CPU will downclock itself, usually by reducing its power input. But after that initial burst of speed, I wanted to see what a sustained workload would look like on the CPU. And the results are actually not that bad. A 10 minute running average after the CPU had reached its thermal equilibrium, we see performance cores settle into between 3.6 and 4.1 gigahertz. The efficiency cores meanwhile clocked down to 3 gigahertz. Now one of the CPU cores on here, that is P core number 3, sat at around 100 degrees Celsius for the entire duration of this test. But it was also very much an outlier. Most of the performance cores settled in right around 90 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, the efficiency cores also stayed fairly cool themselves at just 77 degrees Celsius. And the package power settled in at around 89 watts, which it was able to sustain until I turned off the load. But heavy load is a stress test. It's literally designed to bring your CPU to its knees using a worst case scenario to test your system's stability and overall performance. What if you're not expecting this to transcode video or run AVX workloads on your CPU? What if you just wanted to use this budget CPU as a gaming PC? What would performance look like in a gaming workload? I ran Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which is a fairly CPU intensive game, and let temperatures equalize before taking a 10 minute average. And the results were actually incredibly impressive. Now we did see that pesky performance core number three trigger a thermal throttle event. However, it was settling in at closer to around 92 degrees Celsius under a sustained gaming workload. Efficiency cores had no problem holding 3.7 gigahertz across all six cores and had a max temperature of just 68 degrees Celsius. Performance cores meanwhile had no problem holding between 4.4 and 4.7 gigahertz with a max temperature of just 88 degrees Celsius, excluding the 92 from performance core number three. 
As far as power draw, during our sustained gaming test, we saw just 79 watts in total on the CPU package. But the most impressive thing about a system like this is when the CPU gets out of its own way and lets the graphics card stretch its legs. Again, I wanted as much graphics horsepower as I could possibly fit into this 10.4 liter chassis, and that's exactly what we got with the 4070 Ti Super. Under the same 10 minute average on Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, the graphics card held 2.77 gigahertz on the GPU core. GPU memory was clocked at 2.61 gigahertz. Fan speed on the graphics card never exceeded 50%, with the hottest graphics core hitting just 64 degrees Celsius. That's incredibly impressive given we're running Tiny Tina's Wonderlands at 175 frames per second at 1440p and ultra settings. In fact, power measured from the wall averaged just 430 watts, with a max of 488 watts during that sustained gaming test. What's even more impressive though is the power draw when we weren't gaming. This system sitting at idle at the Windows desktop drew just 48 watts of power measured from the wall. So how is performance in gaming overall? Well, you already know about the 173 FPS average in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. What you don't know though is it also managed a 110 FPS 1% low and a 49 FPS 0.1% low. In this title, the 0.1% low is always a bit skewed because there's always some hitching between hip fire and scope fire in this game. I've mentioned this pretty much every time I've ever reviewed this title. A 110 FPS 1% low at 1440p and the absolute ultimate of ultimate settings is also the best performance I've ever benchmarked in this game. Doom Eternal is known to scale quite well with as much graphics horsepower as you can possibly throw at it. It averaged in this system 413 frames per second with a 1% low of 255 and a 0.1% low of 201. That means on my 165Hz monitor, I never once saw a frame that was slower than the refresh rate of that monitor. Helldivers 2 is the latest multiplayer hotness, and we had no trouble at all running this at 1440p and again maximum settings, averaging 146.7 FPS, a 1% low of 109, and a 0.1% low of 88. Competitive and co-op shooting games are the games that you want the least amount of latency and the most consistency from your frame times. Running Helldivers 2 at 144 FPS with a 1% low of 110 and still being able to keep all that eye candy on is a result I will take every single day of the week. Most of the time when I test out Red Dead Redemption 2, I run it with some compromises. I've lowered a setting somewhere, whether it be water reflection or tessellation on trees. There's always some setting that, up until very recently, has prevented me from running it at its ultimate settings at a reasonable frame rate. Here though, we're running at ultra settings and 1440p. We have an average of 123 frames per second, a 1% low of 78, and a 0.1% low of 68. I say this every time I review it, but Red Dead Redemption 2 never fails to take my breath away, nor have I ever seen it running this well. Last but not least, Starfield does not get nearly the credit it deserves as being one of the most demanding games on the PC that we've ever seen. At 1440p, with all the settings cranked as high as they will go, and without any cheaters like DLSS or frame generation, we see an average of 90 frames per second, a 1% low of 49, and a 0.1% low of 40. While it's not a multiplayer game, I do find I want the combat to be a little bit more responsive than a 0.1% low of 40 FPS here. On this system, I would still probably lower a couple settings to see if I can bump that up to maybe 70 FPS. But overall, an incredibly impressive result and an overall gorgeous looking game. So on this PC I built behind the scenes for my own enjoyment, what is my verdict of this platform? There are going to be some who look at these results with the 13900H engineering sample CPU and immediately dismiss it because it thermal throttled or it couldn't hold 5.4 gigahertz the entire time. I always take reviews a little bit differently though. I try to look at reviews starting from the price point, in this case $289 for the motherboard and CPU combo, and try to determine if I would be disappointed at that price point. And this is one of those cases where even though there are some limits on the top end performance, I love the value proposition on display here. Did the CPU thermal throttle under massive workloads? Yes, it did. That might be able to be solved with a slightly larger cooler as well. Again, I used a low profile Be Quiet cooler that maxes out at 2000 RPM and is one of the smallest coolers you could possibly mount on this board. There's no reason in the world I couldn't have used an ID cooling IS30 or maybe an IS55 on this thing with six heat pipes and managed to keep the CPU in some fairly reasonable temperature ranges. In this case, I used the Be Quiet and that did hurt my performance a little bit. However, did it hamper my CPU performance when it came to gaming? 
And the ultimate answer here is no, it didn't. Could I have hit 500 frames per second instead of 413 FPS in Doom Eternal? Had I gone with a 13600K or a Ryzen 7900X3D? Yes, I think that would have been achievable. And look, I am all for eliminating bottlenecks if ultimate performance is your ultimate goal. But if ultimate performance was my goal, this would have had a 4090 in it. This would have had a 7950X3D or a 14900K. I wouldn't have been buying this CPU or a 4070Ti Super or DDR4 or any other component that could potentially even slightly slow down my overall performance. Overall, the features and performance on this board made it absolutely perfect for what I wanted it to be. And that was an incredibly tiny system that draws fairly low amounts of power and is able to power some of the latest graphics cards. In this case, a 4070Ti Super. The 10729 motherboard with a 13900H engineering sample CPU behind it is incredibly fast, sips on power, and has no trouble powering the latest graphics cards. What more could you ask for in a motherboard that costs just $289 for the CPU and motherboard combined? In fact, if you wanted to spend a little bit less, there's also a 12900H engineering sample board for just $179 on AliExpress right now. If you're interested in either the 12900HES or the 13900HES motherboards from 10729, I will have AliExpress affiliate links down in the video description, as well as affiliate links for pretty much everything else that I use to put this PC together. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on social media at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description and will get you exclusive access to my Discord server. And that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. for today is from Ratchet Brewing out in Silverton, Oregon. It is the Deuce Coop IPA, clocking in at 6.8%, featuring Cascade, Citra, and Simcoe hops. I'm here at the bottom of the beer simply because I forgot to start reviewing it because I was enjoying it so much. So Ratchet Brewery, I do have a connection with Ratchet Brewery. I know the owners, Dan and Julie. Uh, in fact, I've drank with them many times. I've uh, gone to beer conventions and tasting events with them many times. Uh, we both started our business the same year. In 2017, I went and founded Craft Computing. Uh, Dan went and founded Ratchet Brewery. Uh, so we started literally the same month as each other. And uh, I've got to say, this was one of the first beers that he ever produced. And it's still one of my favorites. So Cascade, Citra, and Simcoe hops. Um, you get a really interesting combination there. You get a little bit of melon with a little bit of floral. It's not your traditional Northwest super citrusy or super dank IPA. This is what I would consider a traditional West Coast IPA, uh, more in the ilk of, of Stone or Sierra Nevada. The nose on this, very, very sweet. It's like flower hibiscus, honeydew melon. It's that kind of kind of aroma to it. The flavor, though, is, I won't say polar opposite, but it's not what you'd expect. It's a very bitter. The nose on this is slightly sweet. It's, it's flour. It's hibiscus. It's a little honeydew melon. The flavor on this, I won't say polar opposite, but it's not what you would expect. It's a little bit bitter. It's a little bit grassy. It's a little bit vegetal. It's not the, the sweet fruit and flower that you get from the nose. It's, it's a little bit more drying. It's a wonderfully delicious beverage. One of my favorites. And I'm happy to know them. Cheers, everyone.